because I also link it to my people and the poor of my people uh, to think to them uh, also they are fighting to be alive. To be alive is uh, the first human uh, demand. Poverty is exactly the contrary of uh, the, to be alive. It is uh, in the last analysis uh, death early and uh, just this. There are two important points about liberation theology that I want to make. The first is this uh, statement uh, expressed by the Brazilian theologian Rubem Alves way back in 1969. This was one of the first expressions of liberation theology. The poor in Latin America came to realize that they were not simply poor. They were made poor. This is extremely important. This was an extremely important insight for people to grasp. That is, they were not simply poor. It was not that God created them to be poor. It was not that they were poor because they were lazy or that they were lacking in intelligence or talent. They were made poor. Another way of putting that is that they were not simply poor, but impoverished. Now we could say they were impoverished because their land was taken away at the very beginning of colonization. They continued to be impoverished because they were paid slave wages uh, or even less. And through the centuries, the poor, the masses of people of Latin America have never received the kind of adequate education and health care which could help them to grow and to have a decent life. So they were impoverished through the centuries. It's also true that Latin America has been impoverished over the centuries by the international economic system, various forms of colonialism and imperialism, which are designed for the benefit of the home country, what we call the first world countries. They're not designed for the benefit of the masses of people in Latin America. And so, for instance, multinational corporations can come in to any country of Latin America, buy up natural resources at a very low price, make use of very cheap labor, and we're still seeing that as uh, creating problems and harming the interests of the working class here in the United States. But multinationals can move their operations to Latin America and make use of cheap labor. And they've always been demanding favorable access to markets in Latin America for their products and investments. We can see this now more than ever in the U.S.'s insistence on free trade agreements. The problem is that cheap imports from the U.S. can wipe out local production. So this is a system that more and more the liberation theologians have seen and have explained, have analyzed, as something that is not in the interests of the vast majority of the people of Latin America and that needs to be changed. But then when people try to change it, they run into the force, the violence, 
of their own government supported by the U.S. The United States has consistently over the, during the past century, for instance, uh, supported military regimes, military dictatorships in many cases, which protect the interests of the oligarchy of those countries and which protect the interests of U.S.-based multinational corporations. And so the goal then, according to the liberation the theology people, is not simply development within the system. They have felt that the poor masses, the poor majorities of Latin America will never have substantial change, never have significant change in their conditions unless they challenge some of the basic principles and structures of this <clears throat> unjust and exploitative economic system. U.S. foreign policy during the past century has been characterized by using every means necessary and possible to stop socialist revolution, especially in this hemisphere, but throughout the world. And where socialist revolution has succeeded, using every means possible to try to reverse that, as in the case of Chile during the early 70s. Nicaragua had a revolution which succeeded in 1979, but that simply led the U.S. to a more complete commitment to stop the spread of socialist revolution throughout Latin America, especially Central America. So the people of Latin America have not really been free for their own self-determination. They have not been free to structure their society and their economy along socialist lines or whatever model uh, they would choose. Now, all of this has led people to the conclusion that the masses of people, the poor, the workers, the peasants throughout Latin America, have to struggle themselves for their own legitimate self-interests. That is, they can't wait for the rich to help them, to change things for their benefit. They can't simply be satisfied with the crumbs that fall from the table of the rich because that will never be enough to meet the basic needs of the majority of the people. So we have the idea that the poor have to organize themselves, they have to come together, they have to analyze society from their own point of view, they have to understand what needs to be done, and then they have to organize and work politically and apply the pressures that need to be done in order to change society for their own benefit, for their own legitimate self-interest. Uh, the rich can help in this, and, and of course many important movements for social, social change have included people with resources, people with monetary resources, or people with technical or professional skills. That's certainly true. But it has to be for the poor and by the poor. So in uh, Nicaragua, for instance, we have an organization called Nicaraguan Christians for the Poor. This is a network of Christian-based communities around the country. We have one network here in Managua, and then Nicaraguan Christians for the Poor is a network which includes communities from various regions of the country. And this is the name of it, and I think it's very significant that uh, there are some people with resources that are part of Nicaraguan Christians for the Poor, but it is clearly designed to be a vehicle for the poor to exercise their own power. Uh, similarly, a recent book that just came out this year, it's a history of the Christian-based communities of Managua called Pobres por los Pobres, the poor for the poor. Again, uh, the same idea, 
In one text in the conference of Aparecida, uh, the Pope was there, a very important person in, in this conference in uh, 2007. And, um, well, uh, we have a, a text really very important. Uh, we are not really uh, committed to the poor if we are not friends of the poor. Well, friends, the, the word is there. The end of the solidarity, solidarity with the poor is not except uh, exceptions, but it is not uh, to be the voice of the voiceless. themselves, and uh, the solidarity of the poor is not only to, to help uh, persons, certainly in some cases it's very important, but in relation with these marginalized people, the question, the first, is to respect the person, and equal, <laughs> because it is uh, human dignity, it is this, recognize the human dignity of the poor. I know the good, uh, the good uh, intention of the persons sometimes uh, speaking about uh, to be the voice of the voiceless. I understand this very well. But I try to say it's not exactly the first question. The first question is the poor themselves uh, must uh, 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 have a voice. It is one important point, I think, uh, in the agenda of uh, the Pope Francisco. To act and to, 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 uh, to be uh, close to the poor, but as persons, not only as objects to be uh, help sometimes sometimes in emergency it happens certainly but normally no how do people experience god precisely in their struggle for social justice and liberation i would sum it up in this way as the poor and oppressed come together to organize communities as they begin to know and care for one another as they acquire a sense of their own dignity and rights as they analyze the social, political, and economic causes of their impoverishment, as they develop strategies which provide a concrete and practical hope of changing their lot and of having a better life, as they begin to take organized action to remedy injustice, overcoming their fear of opposition and persecution, as they experience some victories and some defeats, as they celebrate what they have done and learn from their experience, and as they return to the struggle with new commitment, Many of them feel a force at work in them and in the community, giving them hope and courage and a very practical love. Christians experience this force as the working of Jesus, the prophet and martyr in them, and as the fruit of the Holy Spirit, who helps us to love and to speak boldly as the Spirit enabled the early Christians to do. This is God's self-revelation to us, as Yahweh revealed himself to the people of Israel as their liberator from oppression. A corollary of this is that if the experience of taking part in the struggle for justice and freedom is necessary in order to feel God at work in that struggle, then it is clear why the rich and the powerful, the oppressors, cannot understand or appreciate a theology which is based on their victim's kind of experience. But if they respond to the Lord's call to join society's victims in the struggle for the kingdom of justice and peace, then they too can do theology of liberation. 
In the final part of my presentation, I would like to explore with you a little further the relation between liberation theology and practice, and also to look at the role of prayer in liberation theology. By prayer, I'm referring more to contemplation or meditation rather than to repetitive or recited prayers. So I'm referring more to the contemplation or meditation of the life of Jesus, for instance, in the Gospels, or the action of God in the Old Testament, or the action of God in our own experience, in our own lives. And this is extremely important because some of the critics of liberation theology have said that the liberation theologians are really reducing faith to social or political action or struggle, but nothing could be further from the truth. The liberation theologians are people of deep faith and are very prayerful, and they emphasize the need for prayer, the need for contemplation, the need for contact with God in our lives of struggle. Now, many of the liberation theologians have emphasized that liberation theology is a second moment. I think we can understand what this means uh, in this way. I would say that uh, theology is a reflection on our experience of God's presence in our participation in the struggle for liberation and justice. So in a certain sense, this reflection, this theology, is based on our experience of God's presence in our work for justice. In the words of Gustavo Gutierrez, the Peruvian theologian of liberation, in his book, We Drink From Our Own Wells, uh, he defines the Christian as a follower of Jesus and says that reflection on the experience of following constitutes the central theme of any solid theology. So if we are following Jesus as our Redeemer, which means our Liberator, then we are reflecting on our experience of collaborating with him in the struggle for the kingdom of justice and peace, the struggle of freedom. Gustavo Gutierrez goes on to note that uh, this kind of reflection was and continues to be preceded by the spiritual experience of Christians who are committed to the process of liberation. So once again, it's reflection on the experience that we have. And he also continues, the importance of experience or practice in the theology of liberation is in keeping with the purpose of that theology, which is to develop a reflection that is concerned with and based on practice in the light of faith. So here we see again that the reflection is based on practice, based on our commitment and on our experience. And it is a reflection that is meant to help that practice, to deepen our commitment. He continues also, discourse on faith is a second stage in relation to the life of faith itself. That is, thinking about our faith, reflecting, analyzing our faith is a second stage. This methodological statement is a central one in the theology of liberation. But the statement does not imply a separation of the two stages or aspects. Now, this is a very interesting distinction that he is making. Let's go on to see what he means by this. The point is to emphasize the fact that authentic theological reflection has its basis in contemplation and in practice. Talk about God, theology, the study of God, comes after the silence of prayer and after commitment. Now, here Gustavo is talking about prayer and contemplation. And this gets us into the second point that I wanted to emphasize here in closing my presentation that the liberation theologians are very strong on the need for prayer and contemplation in order to give depth and energy to our commitment. And I think we could put it in this way. Uh, it is in prayer 
that is in the sense of reflection, meditation on Jesus and the Gospels, as I said, on God's action in the Old Testament, calling Moses, calling the prophets, uh, denouncing injustice, working for liberation, and uh, our reflection on God's action in our own lives, that we detect, delight in, and derive strength from Jesus' presence and friendship with us in the struggle for liberation and justice. And I think finally we can say that the purpose of liberation theology is to help us to see that love for the poor and oppressed and a commitment to work for liberation and social justice are essential elements of biblical faith. The kind of biblical study and analysis that the liberation theologians do helps us to see how central uh, the poor and the oppressed and our love for them are in our faith and how necessary it is to translate our love for the poor and for the victims of society into effective social and political action to bring about liberation and justice in this world. And in this way, the liberation theology helps us to grow in that love and commitment. So the result is in practice by your fruits you will know them. Liberation theology is very much oriented towards the growth of Christians and the growth of our commitment to the struggle for a better world, for the kingdom of God.